People of Redemption, welcome to Easter Sunday. My name is Pastor Brandon, and I am so glad that you're joining us today. I'm gonna encourage you, go ahead and hit that share button and share this message with someone who needs hope today because here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have a candid conversation, but it's gonna be an incredibly hopeful conversation. Now, here's the candid part. We all have fears, right? All of us. No one's immune to not having fears, and we're all susceptible and prone. Now, we may have different fears. I was going through a list of different kinds of phobias and found some really weird phobias. Uh, There's a fear of beards. You may not like me if you have a fear of beards. Uh, There's a fear of clouds in the sky. There's a fear of the number eight. There's a fear of the color yellow. All kinds of unique and weird phobias out there. But here's the reality. We all have fears. Now, here's what I believe about fears and what we see both in experience and in the scriptures. There's a fear underneath all of our fears. I'm gonna call this the great fear. And what it does is it it drives all the rest of the fears that we have. I mean, think about if you have a fear of heights, really, if you work that all the way out and you were to experience that fear, what's the likely outcome? It's the great fear. If you have a fear of claustrophobia, right? I mean, you're claustrophobic, that you're scared of being trapped and not being able to escape in a really small place. The natural outworking of that would be the great fear. And this is the great fear. It's the fear of death. Now, this is a fear that's inescapable, right? I mean, there's no way to escape the fear of death. Here I stand in a cemetery right now with with people who have gone before us, people who live lives before us, who have found the grave to be their resting place. Death is inescapable. As a matter of fact, right now, over the next minute, 180 people on average will pass away in our world. Tomorrow, today, for the coming weeks, we'll get stats about who has passed away from this terrible COVID-19 virus. So all of us are always confronted with this fear, the fear of death. And we're not alone. I mean, when you look throughout all of cultures and all of people groups, every culture, every people group has been scared of death. Even in the Bible, the psalmist in Psalm 55, four says, my heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Death has been a great source of fear for every culture. It's birthed many, many religions because it is the fear underneath all of our other fears. Now, how as we, as Christians, do we handle and look at and understand and wrestle with fear? What I wanna do for you today is I wanna give you three truths to understand, know, and rest in. And I believe that these truths will free us from the fear of death. We're gonna look at Hebrews chapter two, verse 14 and 15. And this is what it says. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, He himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Here's truth number one that we see. Without Jesus, we are all enslaved to the fear of death. Back in 1973, uh, there was a a book that came out. It was called The Denial of Death. And it was written by a man named Ernest Becker. Now, Ernest was not a Christian. Uh, He didn't have a Christian worldview. But this was his thesis. The main thesis of this book is that the fear of death haunts the human animal like nothing else. It is a mainspring of human activity, activity designed largely to avoid the fatality of death to overcome it by denying in some way that is the final destiny of man. What he's saying here is everything that we do is driven by a fear of death. And we have work ways that we kind of deny and avoid death. We have medical ways that we try to avoid and mitigate the impending reality that we will die at some point. We have, we have alcoholic ways that we deal with this. We have family ways. We have religious ways. We have all these different activities that we engage in because we're scared of death. The truth is without Jesus, we are enslaved to death. Death is like this taskmaster. It's like this slave owner and it directs us and it controls our every move and our every task. Now, here's the candid part of the conversation, right? Death is real, but 
it's going to be amazingly hopeful because that first shrew said, without Jesus. See, death does not get the final word. Jesus gets the final word. So we're going to continue to worship, and then we're going to look at how Jesus frees us from the fear of death. In the first part of this message, we saw that the fear of all fears is the fear of death. Matter of fact, we said it's the fear behind the fear. And the Bible explains that it actually traps us, it enslaves us. And so everything we do is driven by this fear, this timidness towards death. Now, here's the really good news. While that's a very frank conversation, now let's talk about the hope that we have. Because in Jesus, we have so much hope when it comes to death. Let's go back to Hebrews. Hebrews 14 through 15. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood. That's you and me. That just simply means, hey, we're humans. He himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has power of death. That is the devil. So Jesus, what happens is he becomes man. Jesus, who is fully God. He sits on the throne. He rules. He reigns. He's a part of the Trinity. He comes and becomes fully God. Man, this is called the incarnation. And clearly to free us or to destroy the power of death, well, we need Jesus. We need Jesus to come and, and dwell among us. We need Jesus to save us. Now, there's a couple reasons why it was necessary that Jesus come and put on flesh and blood and become fully man. First is humanity has sinned against a perfect creator. You getting that? The Bible says the wages of sin is death and that all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. In other words, no one's been perfect. We've all sinned against our creator. And guess what? The rightful payment for our sin is death. So man owes a debt to God in the form of death. It's part of our consequences. It's part of the debt incurred to us by sin. Another reason why it was necessary is there was no way for us to atone for our own sins. None of us are perfect, right? None of us could offer up a perfect life to God. We incurred a debt so large because, because of our sins that there was no way for us to pay that debt back. The only perfect one is God himself. So God devised this magnificent plan where he, the perfect holy one, would, would send his one and only son to become man, fully God, fully man, and then he would pay the debt in our place for our sin. Let me, let me explain it to you this way. Uh, there was a story by a guy named Ernest Gordon. Ernest Gordon was a prisoner of war in a Japanese uh, camp for three years during World War II. And he describes one day after they had been working all day long, which was the norm, they would work all day long, all, this, all the prisoners lined up. And one of the soldiers began to be irate and he began to yell and to scream. And he was yelling like, where's the shovel? Where's the shovel? See, every day after their work, they would pile up the tools in a certain spot. And then there would be an accounting of all the tools. And if one tool was missing, then the prisoners were going to have to pay. So the irate soldier goes, where's the shovel? Where's the shovel? Where's the shovel? And he goes, who stole the shovel? Step forward. Well, nobody stepped forward. And then he goes, if no one steps forward, then they all die. Finally, one man steps forward. The soldier went over and beat him to death. They ended up recounting the shovels and realized there was a miscount initially, that no shovel had been stolen. And so what you had is you had an innocent man step forward and pay the price for the rest of them. Now, while every story, every analogy falls short of, of the beautiful story of the gospel, it certainly helps us understand that Jesus stepped forward, fully God, fully man. He stepped forward and said, you know what? I'm paying the price in their place for their sin. And so guess what happens now? Here's truth number two. Jesus's death destroyed the power of sin. What a wonderful truth. See, if without Jesus, we're enslaved to sin, well, because of Jesus, no longer does the power of sin rule and reign in the life of those who trust him. So there's great news. Now, again, we're not done. We still have another part. There is still more hope to come because of the resurrection of Jesus. Stick around with us. 
So the last part of the message. See, we saw at the beginning that without Jesus, we are enslaved to our fear of death. I mean, fear of dying controls every part of our life. But then we saw in the second truth that because of Jesus' death, he has destroyed the power of sin and death. So when he came and he died in our place for our sins, a great reversal began to happen, reversing all of the consequences of the great curse. The consequences of our sin began to be reversed. But there's one final truth that remains for us to rest in, believe, and trust in. So let's read Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 again. It says, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through the fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Now note that word deliver. Deliver literally means something or someone was in bondage and they have been set free. They were in shackles and those shackles were released and they have complete and total freedom. So Jesus' death, it destroyed the power of sin and death in our lives. So what does his resurrection mean? Well, truth number three, Jesus' resurrection delivers us from the fear of death. It delivers us from the fear of death. We were held in bondage by the, being scared of dying and what is to come. But because he is resurrected and secured complete and total victory, then we are released from every great fear. And here's what this means for you. First, death is not the end. You know, if the resurrection isn't true, death is a frightful endeavor. Right, to, to, to die would be a frightening thing because we just simply return to dust. But if the resurrection is true, if Jesus has rose from the grave, then we have a very great hope that extends beyond the grave and lasts into eternity. That God offers us not just life right here, but eternal life here and forevermore. Yes, death can be brutal here on earth, but it does not get the final word. The final word is that Jesus was resurrected and rose from the grave. I love what theologian Frederick Buckner said. He says this, resurrection means the worst thing is not the last thing. Let me say that again. Resurrection means that the worst thing, death, is not the last thing. No, we have a hope that extends beyond the grave. And so death may come, but its power has been banished because of the resurrection of Jesus. And last, we can stand in confidence before the throne of God. See, some of us are, are, are scared of death because of the unknown. Jesus, his resurrection secures that we know what is to come, resurrection. Our second great fear is to stand before God. And without grace, without mercy, we have no hope in front of him. But here's the beautiful thing. Jesus' resurrection, his death and resurrection, secure that we can stand in front of the throne room of God with complete confidence that when you and I breathe our last breath here on earth and we stand before a creator in eternity, that we can stand there with confidence because we have an advocate who is Jesus. We have a mediator who is Jesus, that he stands alongside of us. We will never stand before the throne room of God alone because of Jesus. We will always stand there with an advocate, with a mediator, with our savior and king. He has saved us from our sins. He has extended us grace that we stand before the throne room of God, clothed not in our righteousness, not in our resume, not in our morality. No, we stand there perfect, blameless in his righteousness because Jesus has clothed us with that. And so I'm gonna encourage you, if you've never trusted Jesus, Jesus offers us a secure future through his resurrection. Death does not get the final word. And he offers us a confident future. 
that we can stand before God because of Jesus when we trust in Jesus' life, clothed in his perfection and his righteousness. We would beg you and implore you to trust Jesus today. I'm gonna end with this. Friends, we have nothing to fear because Romans 8, 38 through 39 says, for I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, not death, not life, absolutely nothing. Rest in that, trust in that. Now, one of the most beautiful acts that we have as a church that symbolically displays the beautifulness of death and life in Jesus is the act of baptism. Here in a moment, you are gonna see a brave little man step forward and declare to everyone that Jesus' death as he goes into the water is his death, that Jesus died in his place for his sins. And then as he comes out of the water, that Jesus' resurrected life is his life and that he has eternal life in Jesus. What a beautiful picture of the gospel we have in baptism. At this time, I wanna show you this beautiful picture.